It's all okay, yours, Clint. I'm, uh, my name is Clint Knudsen. Uh, I'm 88 years old. I was born in a little town west of here called Hutchinson. That's where I went to high school. I grew up on a farm out southwest of Hutchinson where my grandparents, one set of my grandparents, Niels and Hilma Knudsen, had immigrated from Denmark in 1883. And they homesteaded on this parcel of land which was located on a prairie lake called Eagle Lake. So I grew up on this farm that was located on a lake shore. It was a wonderful place to grow up because it had lots of wildlife, it had lots of birds, mud turtles, skunks, whatever. So I grew up sort of as a nature boy and that's probably the reason when I went to college where I went to Gustavus Adolphus that I majored in zoology. Um, I soon learned that I really didn't want to be a farmer because I, I didn't like milking cows and I didn't like pitching hay. But so I, I decided that even though this was a wonderful place, I didn't want to be a farmer. I grew up essentially in a male household. My mother died when I was five and so my dad, who never married again, brought me up. He and his older brother, Christian, ran the farm. I had an older sister, but she died rather young, and she had a three-year-old son, so my dad took him too. So the two guys raised me and my nephew in an all-male household. I was drafted into the army in 43. I always thought dates were kind of interesting because I was sworn into the army on my 20th birthday and I was sworn out of the army on Christmas Eve of 1945. Uh, one of the questions they ask about is where did you train? I went to a camp in Kentucky called Fort Campbell and I was assigned to the 20th Armored Division. And I took my training there and it asked in the questions, questionnaire about what was your training like. Some of it was okay, but a lot of it was pretty boring. Do you know what I mean? In the Army, sometimes they sort of decide, well, what are we going to do today to keep these guys occupied? Let's go on a 50-mile hike which we did with full pack. It's so, sort of that kind of thing. But anyway, after I finished training, I was shipped off to the East Coast to a camp near Boston, Miles Standish, and eventually uh, was sent to England in preparation for, for the invasion. We went across in a convoy. There were, it was amazing, because as far as you could see in any direction, there were ships. And we, we zigzagged all the way from Boston to Liverpool because they, there was still some threat of German submarines. And then after we got to uh, Liverpool, we went to a tented camp in some kind of a uh, sort of a mansion yard somewhere near Bath in England. And Eventually, I was assigned to a tank battalion, 747th Tank Battalion, and we drove our tanks in from kind of that part of England down way south in England to Plymouth, and we were to get these tanks ready for the invasion, which meant that we had to waterproof them. We put something I think they call cosmoline. We, we caulked all the seams and all the bolts and everything so that this tank could go off into the water up until the top of the turret and that the tanks, which were Shermans, 
were, I suppose the top turret was close to nine feet. Anyway, when we finished this, we eventually loaded onto an LCT. That was a landing craft tank, which was made by the Higgins Company in New Orleans. They produced them by the thousands. I don't know how many LCTs there were in the invasion, but there were a lot. And we eventually crossed the channel. Our tank battalion was supposed to be the third wave in. On D-Day. Third wave. Yeah. On D-Day. On D-Day, yeah, on Omaha Beach. Okay. And um, we crossed at night and got there early in the morning because the the landings were supposed to begin on Omaha, I don't know, about 6.30 in the morning. Well, we waited offshore essentially the whole day. Things simply did not go as they had been planned on Omaha Beach. Was it still, stormy? Time, was it still it, stormy that day? It was what? Was it still stormy that day? No, it wasn't too bad. Okay. It, it, you know, it had been delayed because we actually started out from Plymouth I think it was the 4th, and then Eisenhower had delayed the invasion by a day because the weather was so bad. But then we, so we came back and we anchored out off Plymouth Harbor and then started across again. Well, anyway, um, we were third wave, but by the time we got in, it, it was late in the day, and it was total chaos. It was, uh, things didn't go and as they were planned and so forth. But I guess that's, that's the way things happen. Um, I, um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this. But anyway, I ended up doing all the way from Normandy to Germany in a tank. And this, the, the, the old Sherman tank, it wasn't as good, I don't think, as the, as the Tiger German tank, but it, but it, we had no more of them. I mean, we, we had an advantage in numbers. Um, I um, lasted all the way to Germany, and I was in the Hürtgen Forest near Aachen in Germany, and we were taking some uh, sort of artillery fire, I think 155 millimeter stuff that was coming in, and it was pretty heavy, and that's all I remember. Because apparently something must have hit the tank. Anyway, I, I must have conked out for a while, because I remember when I sort of became aware again, I was back at a field hospital, and they then trans transferred me to Liège in Belgium to a hospital there and once you get in the in the rigmarole they put me on a hospital ship not a hospital hospital train and uh, we went all the way to Paris on this train and then at Paris they put me on a C47 and flew me back to England and I went to a, a hospital in, in England for a while then eventually I went back to the continent, crossed the Rhine. They didn't reassign me back to the tanks. They assigned me to a quartermaster corps. So I crossed the Rhine into Monheim, and the rest of the war I spent doing supply for the Seventh Army. But anyway, I thought what I'd like to do, I'd like to just re read something that I wrote. Is that all right? Sure. I, um, during the, the war, I wrote absolutely nothing down. They frowned on it. They s thought you should not keep a diary, that's what we were told, because if you were captured uh, as a prisoner of war, you might have written down something, stuff that might be uh, valuable. I think that's highly unlikely. But anyway, so I wrote nothing during the entire war. And... Uh, then I came back and I sort of forgot about the war. And I, in the summer of 
2003. What would two, that, that would be a few years ago. When I came home in 1945, after the war was over, I made a deliberate decision to put war memories out of mind. I tried not to think about the war, to talk about the war to anyone. I think that many returning vets made the same decision. It was now time to get on with our lives. Then some 30 years later, <clears throat> a teaching colleague asked me to talk to his class about World War II. Passage of time had made it possible for me to talk about the invasion and the liberation of France. When 50 years had passed, I still wasn't ready to go back. <clears throat> but then last winter, after a couple of scotches, I decided that if I were going to go back, it had to be soon. Emotionally, the trip was harder than I anticipated, but I don't regret having done it. It was a beautiful, warm spring day in Normandy. I carried a floral tribute and placed it at the monument in the American Cemetery at Omaha Beach. Then we all stood at attention as taps echoed over those 10,000 graves, then the national anthem. I'm not a super patriot, but these were probably the most emotional moments of my life. My thoughts were about those guys that didn't make it. I could be lying out there among those white crosses and stars of David, but I was a survivor, not because I was a better soldier or a better human being, but I just happened to luck out. A lot of guys didn't. At the American Cemetery, I needed to connect somehow, so I found the grave of Daryl C. Mellon, PFC, 29th Infantry Division, Minnesota, died June 7, 1944, Private First Class. There is no more honorable rank in the U.S. Army. I knelt on his grave. We decided to spend another day at Omaha Beach, so the next morning, before anyone was around, I walked alone on that beautiful but bloody beach and I wept. When I was drafted, the Army questioned recruits to determine placement. The interviewer asked if I had experience with guns. I said that as a teenager, I used to shoot this, our state mascot, the Golden Gopher, with a 22 rifle. Assignment, tank gunner. That figures. The Sherman tank was mass-produced during the war. It probably wasn't as good as the German Tiger tank. It was speedy, but had less firepower in its 75 millimeter cannon. We simply had more tanks than the Germans at the time of the invasion. I rode in the turret and fired the cannon while looking through crosshairs in a periscope. Tanks are hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and dusty when it hasn't rained. Basically, they are very uncomfortable. Before the invasion, we spent a couple of months in England waterproofing the tank, which meant caulking the seams and bolts so that we could go into several feet of water. When the time came, we crossed the channel on a land landing craft tank, LCT. The LCT carried five tanks. We sailed out of Plymouth, <coughs> but were called back because Eisenhower had delayed the invasion for a day due to bad weather. Crossing the channel was awesome. There were ships of all kinds as far as we could see. Some ships had blimps attached to them to prevent strafing by the Luftwaffe, which was by now almost non, a non-threat. We were a separate tank battalion attached, attached to the 29th Infantry division, the blue and the gray. Since we are not a regular part of a tank division, we were called bastards, which I thought was appropriate. We were to be the third wave on Omaha Beach, but seldom does anything go as planned during war, and our entry was delayed. For a while, General Bradley even considered abandoning Omaha Beach. It was late in the day. The tide was out. When the LCT dropped the ramp, we entered only about three feet of water. We had been told to follow the tank in front of us, and if they made it through the minefields, 
we were probably would be safe. About two minutes after disembarking, we hit a landmine that the previous two tanks had passed over. It blew off two of our bogey wheels and split one tread. Tanks don't run well on one tread. None of the five of us was injured. We abandoned the tank. Ironically, our tank was named Ceaseless. <laughs> the first thing I saw on the wet sand was a severed leg, complete with combat boot, but washed of all blood by the tide. We made our way up the beach, which was under continuous fire. I still have difficulty talking about the bodies on the beach. I didn't have a weapon, so I found a slight depression in the beach and hunkered down there for the night. The next morning I decided to return to the tank and s retrieve some of my belongings, my burp gun. But the tides are high in, in Normandy and the tank was totally underwater and everything was saturated with seawater. A day or so later I found my tank company and one of the gunners had been wounded in the foot so I replaced him in that tank. I know that the flyboys of the Air, po Air Force are glamorized and I guess sometimes even the tankers get some glory, but I still think the real heroes in France were the infantry. Those foot soldiers, the real grunts of the war, finally moved into St. Lô and our tanks followed. The plan had been to take St. Lô in a day but actually it took six weeks of heavy fighting. After the breakout at St. Lô, we moved rather quickly across France toward Paris. We were joined by those wonderful French guys of the underground, the Maquis, or the French forces of the interior. They came out of the woods, literally, and they rode on the decks of our tanks. We always had at least four or five of them. One of them was my age, 21 and we became instant buddies, even though he spoke no English and I spoke no French. We shared our rations, such as they were, and also our cigarettes. Most of us smoked in those days. My new friend had made a French flag and had by hand stitched onto it the Cross of Lorraine, the symbol of the French forces of the interior. The cross was made of metallic foil strips which the B-17s dropped during bombing raids over Germany. This chaff helped disrupt radar and made it more difficult for the German anti-aircraft gunners to hit their targets. We flew that flag from the antenna of our tank all the way to Paris. Can war ever be fun? Seldom. But sometimes we would liberate several villages in a day with no resistance and always the citizens would be out to welcome us with bottles of wine and soon our tanks were covered with flowers. Everyone kissed us, even the guys. How I wish it could be that way in Iraq. When we arrived on the outskirts of Paris, Ike decided that de Gaulle and the French forces should take Paris. So our new French friend le left us. My friend took the French flag from the antenna and gave it to me. I carried it in my musette bag for the rest of the war, and it now is framed and hangs on the wall of our den. He hugged me and kissed me on both cheeks, and then went off to liberate Paris. I never saw him again. But I want to show you a couple of things in the den. I want to show you the French flag. And I want to talk about Barbara's brother. Okay, let's do that. This is the French flag that flew on our antenna all the way from Normandy to Paris. And the French underground guys had made this, and you can see some of it has come off. This is the Cross of Lorraine, which was their symbol, and FFI, French Forces of the Interior. And um, he gave it to me, and I, as I said, I carried it all the way home in my musette bag. Over here, this flag is Belgian, and of the places that we liberated, one of the towns was Bastogne. Nobody had ever heard of Bastogne in September of that, that year. 
so we came into Bastogne and this lovely Belgian woman came out and gave me this little Belgian flag. And then later on, during the Battle of the Bulge, Bastogne, as you know, was surrounded and finally defended itself against the Germans. But anyway, talking of Belgium, Barbara's brother, Leonard, uh, he, he was approximately the same age as I was. He was in the army, he was went into the army, and he was assigned to intelligence, which, and he was stationed at, is it called Governor's Island in New York? And he could have stayed there the rest of the war. But somehow all of his buddy, he was born in Montevideo, a little town west of here, and he, all of his buddies from Montevideo were either in the Far East or in Europe, and he asked to be transferred into the infantry. And so he was assigned to the 7th, 75th Infantry, and shortly after he arrived in Belgium, we had this Battle of the Bulge, and he was killed. So up here is his flag from his from his funeral and over here is during the war uh, Roosevelt sent out a, a little message to everyone that was killed in the war that was a lot of people but anyway this was it says Staff Sergeant Gothard Leonard Lagerstedt who died in services of his country in the European area on January 22nd, 1945. Anyway, I just wanted to, as I said, he was an infantry guy, and I thought of all the guys that were in the war, the real, the real grunts were the infantry. Okay, okay. Coming home now. I came home in December of 45. You came home on a point system and the point system worked out by how many months how many months you'd been in the service, how many months you'd been overseas, how many kind of campaigns you'd been in and so forth. They, they had a, a system worked out so uh, I was fairly soon because the war ended in August and I got home in December. And uh, I thought of my, this little town near where I grew up, and I thought, well, they'll be out with the uh, big parade, the band will be out there to meet me and so forth. <laughs> well, I was discharged on Christmas Eve, another important day. Uh, it was late in the afternoon on Christmas Eve, and I caught that little... No, the, the train from Fort uh, McCoy in Wisconsin over to the Twin Cities and then I caught the little what I call the milk train the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific that went out through this little town. Well about the time I got on the train here in the Twin Cities to go home on Christmas Eve it started to snow and by the time we got out to Stewart is this little town it was a real blizzard. So the train, instead of getting in at 11 o'clock, it got in about 2 in the morning. So I arrived home at this little town, 2 in the morning, in a howling blizzard. There wasn't a soul around. No parade. Not a soul. They, they had a little depot there, but it was locked tight. Well, my dad had lots of friends in town, so I knew one friend whose name was... Uh, Ray Pyle, like in Ernie Pyle. And I knew where he lived, so I dragged my musette bag <laughs> through the blizzard, rapped oh. on the door at 2.30 in the morning, woke them up. He, they put, put me to bed. Then the next day he had a kind of an old jitney truck, and the, the, the blizzard was pretty well over. So he said, I think we can make it through the snow, get you out to the sure as hell. He got me home about noon that day, on Christmas Day. So I arrived home on Christmas Day. There's still no parade. 
<laughs> it was still a homecoming, but the band wasn't out. <laughs> I wanted to tell you one story about hedgerows. We were going down a little roadway between the hedges and up somewhere near us we were taking some fire and it turned out to be the guy had a bazooka and that's a kind of a I never did understand how they get how they operated but a bazooka hit the turret down at the bottom and it its shell was armor piercing and I don't know how they can armor pierce a tank because the tank wall was I think at least three inches thick of steel but that bazooka came through down at the bottom of the turret sort of below my my feet and sort of made a kind of a flash it didn't hurt anybody but we had always been told that in the tank if you get hit if the tank gets hit it's best to abandon and the reason was the tank carried 185 gallons of gas. That's a lot of gas in a tank. And if, if, if something explosive hits anywhere near the tank, then the tank goes up almost immediately. So we've always told, so we abandoned. But anyway, all five of us, there are five guys in the tank, all five of us jumped out to this little depression along the hitch rows. But the, the driver had not taken the tank out of gear. And we were in reverse at the time. So the tank just slowly went down the road there. And then the road made a turn, but there was a hedgerow, didn't? And so the tank just backed up against the, that hedgerow and it went like this and then stopped. <laughs> so we kind of hunkered down and made our way back, got back in the tank and went on our way. But uh, well, you're saying the tank were, didn't, didn't didn't have any problems. It just stopped. It, no, it just stopped. It just it couldn't make it over the over, over the, the hedgerows were you know ten feet high some of them. Um, but anyway, I was thinking about gas mileage. As I said, I went in the tank all the way from Normandy to Germany. I don't know how many miles that is. <clears throat> we used as I uh, what they called high test gas because it had a, a right radial engine, the tank did. Uh, the same kind of an engine that they use in some aircraft. And it, it, it's, its mileage was awful. The tank weighs about 32 ton. And we averaged one mile to the gallon. And we went all the way to Germany. <laughs> so I, I, our gas bill must have been really high. Those tanks had uh, various engines in them, I understand. I had never heard that a radial engine was used in a tank. A lot of them were Cadillacs and some... Well, I think ours them. was a radial. Yeah, That's what radial. someone told me. Right, was there a company called Wright? W-R-I-G-H-T? I'm not sure. Probably. Right? Just like the But anyway, the that's that what it was. The mileage yeah. wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, that's... Did you have to ever get in a one-on-one -on -one fight with some tigers? No, I never, I never came across a tiger. One day we were in the hedgerow country again, and the, the tank commander had noticed down the road some German activity. And it turned out to be what they call a half-track. And he had seen it, and he said, zero in on just where that road turns. You know, in the, in the, the, the gunner has a, a periscope, and in the periscope there's a kind of a little crosshair, and you can operate the 75 millimeter, and coaxially there is a 35 that I could fire. You could fire either one. And the tur turret made a 360 degree turn, so you could fire backwards if you want. Well, anyway, I zeroed in on that little curve down there and I was looking through the periscope and there I saw this this half track and I fired and I hit it the first time. <laughs> I don't know what you know it, it, it was a, it was caused an explosion but uh, that was hedgerow stories. 
I guess that's all I need to say. When did you get married? When did we get married? 1950. 1950. I, I came back and I knew, I, as I told you, I didn't want to be a farmer. So I went to Gustavus and then... Uh, GI Bill, I suppose. GI Bill. It was, a, it was a savior. I mean, it was the, really the greatest, one of the greatest programs we've ever had was the GI Bill because I went to college and uh, I had saved a little money during the war so I got through all the college and met Barbara there during college years and uh, we got married. And um, then I, I, I spent my life teaching. I taught at, well, various places, but I did 28 years at Blake, Blake School in Minneapolis. And uh, then I went back to, went back to um, school in, uh, I went to the University of Texas and got my master's degree there. Um, Still on the GI Bill? Yeah, still on the no, no. I didn't that I didn't have it. I got a scholarship. I had a, a it was called National Science Foundation. It, it, I applied for I think I applied for at least twelve different places, and I I got three scholarships. One to University of Minnesota. No, University of Wisconsin. One to the University of Iowa, and one to the University of Texas. And I, I, so I had a choice. So I chose Texas. The only reason was Warmer. Minnesota and Wisconsin are very similar as, the, as is Iowa. So I, we went to Texas for a year. Barbara and I did another interesting thing after the war. We went back to Europe and worked for a year and a half in the refugee program. After the war ended, there were a lot of what they were called displaced persons, people that had been moved into Germany and uh, Austria and so forth during the war years, and they didn't want to go back to the eastern countries. They, went, they were from Romania and Bulgaria. Some of them were Russians. So, so for a year, we emigrated refugees to the U.S., to Canada, Australia. to Australia, New Zealand, and that, that, that was it was awesome. it was a very satisfying thing to do, because we we made a new life for a lot of people. And that was right after you graduated from. College. Yeah, after we got married, then we went back to to Europe because there was just an amazing number of of refugees after World War II. Anyway, that's my story. <laughs> You were married while you were still a student? What, did, while you were still a student? No, I think... Or had you graduated from college? I, I graduated first. I graduated in 49 and we got married in 50. Yeah. Just after I graduated from Gustavus, we got married. Barbara went to the U and she graduated from the U. And, um, but anyway. Could we get a picture of both you and Barbara together? Sure. Just because this is going to be Barbara, for your family you records go, also. She wants a picture of the both of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Smile. Okay. <laughs> there um, we go. At the, the, the refugee program that he's talking about, you know, the, the, the people who did that, who started that, were the Lutherans. We, uh, you, he was a Lutheran, I, I wasn't, and I didn't really even realize how, how far-sighted they were. The Lutherans, said, you know, all those people, they were all called, they, we called them displaced persons, and they were, you know, you, you, they were, they were, they were in camps in, mostly in Eastern Europe, because they fled from 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 Germany itself and mostly fled. You couldn't fly, flee, flee to France because they wouldn't let you in, but there was so much sort of disarray in Eastern Europe that, that that's where most of them went and ended up. So there were all these hundreds of thousands of refugees and their families who needed to be set, who needed to be settled somewhere. They didn't really want to be settled in Germany. Or or go back to 
Russia or go back to any, any of those Eastern, Eastern Europe, countries. Or Eastern Europe was turning communist at that time, and, and most of Germany was flat on its back. With, I mean, there wasn't housing, there weren't, weren't, weren't enough places. It was one of the live. most successful programs, I thought, uh, in it, the post-war years, was the immigration. Uh, the Lutherans don't get the credit that they need for that, that they should have had for that. Uh, and they were, and they were a number of them were people who who were Minnesotans. They, they people that we, and we were neither one active Lutherans or in any church or anything. We didn't have anything to do with churches, but we, they were, um, we were really. I I think they 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 should get more credit for what they what they. I'm sure that the people who, we had also all kinds of, terrifying stories that, that came that came from in that and I. A few of them we always remember. One big family got got their their little cards that said they could all go to the U.S. And one of the kids, one of the kids, a kid of like eight or nine, turned out to have tuberculosis. Well, they couldn't take him. And what, what were they supposed to do? So all of them stay or go and leave the kid. And they finally did leave the kid behind. Eight, I think he was eight or nine. And all by himself in a hospital, and you know it's heartbreaking for everybody. And we used to, we even went to, we'd go and visit the kid because because we knew he was all by himself, and we told him, "No, no you're going to get there as soon as you're as soon as you're cured, as soon as your tuberculosis is okay." Because there was a lot of tuberculosis among those families because they lived in such horrible situations. For one time, housing. one time I remember. In our, we had an office that we operated out of in Graz, in Austria, and one day one of the uh, Lutheran uh, operations decided they were going to do give people who had lost limbs prost yeah. prostheses, you know, and so we we interviewed people who had lost their legs. And but I, thirty I looked of them in our, I in our around office, my office one day. Here were what thirty people. <laughs> That, that didn't have limbs, and, uh, uh, they, and they, they, they figured a way to get them all fit, they fitted. Did. Finally they got them all, they shipped them Everybody all Everybody got a, a leg. And the, the other part of, of that story that was really interesting was that some, one of the, one, some Lutheran guy, I, my respect for them just went way up. He said, I think they would like to ski. There are wonderful ski places all over. We had a, we had a ski a ski slide right in front of our house where we lived. We lived up on a hill, and we we went down. And then we had we had a jeep. We'd have our driver come down and get the jeep and pick us up and drag us back up the top of the hill so we didn't have to climb. But they had they offered and they had like thirty or forty of these legless persons who hadn't yet been fitted with a, an artificial limb. But they learned to ski on their one leg, and they had thirty of them in a winter in a winter camp. And they were, I mean, we're, it was just amazing. There were all these guys with one leg going. They were almost all men, you know, that, who'd hit a walked over a bum or something like that that lost their limb. We had all we had all kinds of wonderful experiences. We were just, you know, we weren't dry behind the ears. We were just young kids. Ken was older than I am. He's older than I am by four years. But I, I had, I hadn't, I'd had been to Europe before. Uh, bef between the between the war, end of the war and the time we got married, I'd been to Europe once. So, but it was we had wonderful experiences, and my my respect for what the Lutherans have done has never gone away. They've been, it was outstanding. Could I ask, when is your birthday? February 20th. You just had your birthday. You just had a birthday, 88. And Barbara? My, I was, I was, November 22nd is mine, and I was, I was born in 26. Okay. So I'm, I'm halfway. Halfway there? Yeah, halfway through the year. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Listen, I hope they found something. Yeah, you, 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 you didn't. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned <coughs> Bradley, but I thought you were going to tell them the thing that it, the, when he hit yeah. on the when he when they went in the first the first night. I mean, when they went in when they went off the tank, it, it blew up. Yeah. In the water, right, right, right off, right off the LCT.